Hey folks, Joe Bon Giovanni here from the Kettle Pond Institute for Debt-Free Money. And I decided to uh, post a little video here hoping that I can get my uh, 2100V uh, our counterparty to uh, do the same. Maybe we could have a little uh, a broader discussion. You know, these 500 character replies uh, always leave too much too much opening and uh, it gets kind of, kind of confusing. So, you know, I'm going to start at the beginning and say, you know, he, he or she, you know, jumped in here, uh, raising Zimbabwe as if Zimbabwe was in some way relevant, you know, and this is what I want to say about that. To me, anytime you hear people mention Zimbabwe or Weimar, the Republic, and, and talking about what's going on in the United States of America, you know, to me, that absolutely means that they have a another some other agenda, okay? You know, later on it came out, you know, that, uh, you know, the guy wants me to study, an, study Austrian economics, you know, and on the bookshelf behind me, you'll find Rothbard's books, you know, Hayek's books, you'll find... Uh, on Mises books, you know, you'll find, you know, Roberto de Soto's is in the washroom, but, uh, you know, I read Austrian economics, you know, because I have to, you know, I, they're the ones that took up, you know, the study of, of capital, you know, or, and, and so, and so they they have most of the writings that are actually relevant to this, to discussing things like the currency, but, you know, Weimar, and I, just, I put it into my comment, but I want to express it here and how outrageous it is, you know, how outrageous it is when, you know, what we've seen, you know, in the growth of the money supply in this country, and it happened, you know, after the total deregulation of financial services in which everybody could create money things, things that served as money. And the greatest increase that we have, I think, in any way near, might have been around 13% in what used to be the M3 uh, metric of the money supply. And, uh, and there were several years in, in there kind of running together when it, things were getting pretty outrageous when they were 10 or 11, you know, 12 percent. But I want to use that as an example, 10 or 11 or 12 percent a year over a period of, uh, you know, half a dozen years about, you know. And say, so, is there any parallel with that in either Zimbabwe or, or Weimar? Okay, because if there is, then you might say, okay, well, we're actually on the lead up, you know. But the fact is, there is none. There is zero. There's none. So what did in fact happen at first Zimbabwe and then Weimar? Okay. In, in Zimbabwe, because they, and, and, and think about the difference in our economies. Think about the difference in our governments. Think about the, the difference in our, uh, our social institutions and, and things. And, and, you know, what Zimbabwe did was increase the supply of its money by over a billion times, and I think it's 10 billion, Okay, and maybe even a hundred billion. Okay, in one year, in one year. So a hundred percent increase would be one time, and they did a hundred billion times. You know, in one year, and they got hyperinflation. And, well, you know, what's the connection between the five or ten percent that those dastardly investment bankers and shadow bankers did in driving up the M3 by 10 or 11 or 12 percent. You know, where, where's the connection between anything that went on in Zimbabwe and anything that's going on? So when people throw out Zimbabwe and, and, and Weimar, they're not really trying to inform the discussion. They're just trying to scare the hell out of everybody to do something. And my guess is to scare them into buying gold. And that's just my guess. You know, and people want to buy gold, let them, you know, I have no qualms whatsoever about people buying gold, you know, but when we talk about recognizing a bubble, you know, talk, think about it. And then, and then the Weimar, you know, they throw in Weimar, Weimar, what happened with Weimar, the Weimar, the Reichsbank, the, uh, the notes, <laughs> you know, at the end of World War One, under the Versailles Treaty, Okay, and then, by the way, the plan, you know, the, the economic plan, you know, uh, that went into effect that as a result of losing the war, Germany had to follow, uh, put in requirements that said that, that said that uh, the, uh, the government, and by the way, Germany really has, uh, throughout history, had about the best relationship between government and, its, and, its, and it, both its central bank and its money system. 
okay? I mean, really, they have. But 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 what we did, because we said, what we did, what the Allies did, they said, we don't want any government involvement, okay? There's no more monetary policy committee, you know, there's no, none of that stuff. All of the people that are going to be running this bank, setting the monetary policy, therefore, of the country, because they're controlling the currency, are private people, okay? They're private, they're private bankers, okay? The government's out of it. And those private people hired private printing presses, not the Bureau of Engraving and Printing equivalent in Germany, private printing presses hired by private bankers, and they printed up all those Weimar notes. It had nothing to do with the government. It had nothing to do with the government. People should read Stephen Zarlanga's book on the lost science of money, and the chapter on specifically on you know some of the hyperinflation and why the hype of hyperinflation needs to be put to rest in terms of us trying to discuss what to do about the money system in this country, because the money system in this country and throughout the world is in a system of paralysis. And it's, and it's impossible for us to go forward unless we reform the money system. I, we, the monetary reformers, I'm a green backer, and the Austrians agree about that, okay? Which is why I do embrace and why I do read the Austrians, because I know that in order to go forward, we have to compare notes, okay? And we, you're not, you're not going to get the Austrian solution of a free banking, whether it's fractional reserve free banking or full reserve free banking. You're not going to get full reserve banking. You're not going to get any of that stuff unless you go through the government to change the laws and the rules that we have. Now, having said that, you know, you know, and again, to try to deal with some of the issues that, that also were raised by the 2100V uh, person. Uh, the devaluation, now, we hear a lot about, well, the currency has been devalued 90%, you know? Well, you know what? That's poppycock, okay? If the money was devalued 90%, okay, people would lose 90% of the buying power that they have. People haven't lost 90% of the buying power that they have, but the structure of money in society, what a unit uh, of, of, uh, of, of money, a unit of money, buys as a unit of the economy has stayed the same okay not, not stayed the same but it has it has changed over time relevant one, relevant relative one to the other now not one to one relative and i'm not saying that there hasn't been any inflation and i'm not even saying that there hasn't any been any loss of the of the buying power because the because the central banks have failed to carry out their uh you know requirement to maintain the stable buying power of the currency, you know, the, state, the central banks have done that. You know, so so, so you know, I, I gave the example of well, I, I used to earn only ten thousand dollars a year, you know, when I got out of school, you know, and and that, and then you know, when before I retired, I was making you know seventy thousand dollars a year, you know, you know, had my standard of living actually increased that much? No, I mean, I did, I was able to take a few vacations and things like that, but you know. There was no real change. No, I was paying all my bills and the same as I'm saying that I'm doing right now, and I'm much back, back much closer to the ten thousand, you know, in income. So, so again, it's another one of the things that people say, "Well, the currency's been devalued by ninety percent. You better get out of the currency." And everybody's getting out of the currency. That's another thing. Everybody's getting out of uh, out of uh, uh, treasuries. BS, BS. There are some people that are betting against the treasuries. You know, we live in a we live in a, a, a monopoly, monetarily sovereign uh, uh, current with a monetary fiat, monetarily sovereign currency that has no benchmark. It's free to float, and it's freely exchanged on the uh, on the uh, foreign exchange currency exchange markets. So there's going to be a change, and there's going to be people that are going to get into and out of the currencies. That's kind of the name of the game, as long as we have that kind of a system. But you know, to say that, you know, Pepco got out of all it. No, they didn't get out. They got out of it. They got out of a lot of it in, in one of their funds. Okay. To say that, uh, you know, China's getting out of the currency. No, China, China, China got out of the short term. You know, in favor of the long term. Yeah, they did reduce their holdings. So what? Somewhat. Excuse me. But so what? You know. So what if they did? So there's a lot of stuff out there it has no meaning and no relevance to the issue of whether or not the currency is going to collapse. It's not. It's not. 